If you have a Bible this morning, you'll want to turn with me to John chapter 15. There's also a handout that looks like this, without all the notes, uh, that you can follow along with to help you uh, keep up with what's being said this morning. John chapter 15, we know that uh, the vine and the branches starts the whole chapter. Jesus is not going to uh, hold back in John chapter 15. Today we are going to be looking at Jesus sharing genuinely hard sayings with his disciples. Let me begin uh, by asking everybody a question. Which do you prefer first, the good news or the bad news? Does it make a difference for you which one it is? In your experience, which way is better? How do you answer the question? Which do you want first? The good news? The good news or the bad news? Before we uh, answer the question this morning, and as we look into God's Word together, let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord, it's always challenging, even in 2023, as we've been reminded this morning, that there are crazy things, that there are hard times, that there are difficult decisions. And so this morning, as we look into your word and we realize that you st strove, you were striving to help the disciples understand that there would be good times and hard times in the days to come. I just pray that these words of truth will also be encouraging for us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's reset the stage. John has already given us some very memorable snapshots of Jesus uh, especially in his final two weeks of ministry. In John chapter 11, as you can see on the screen, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Whew. Chapter 12, we have a description of the triumphal entry. Chapter 13, the final Passover meal together with the disciples. Also in chapter th 13, John washes the disciples' feet. Excuse me, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Jesus speaks in chapter 14, of going to prepare a place for us. Jesus follows that by promising the Holy Spirit, the Helper. In chapter 14, he also says, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Good words. Chapter 15, Jesus speaks to the vine and the branches. In chapter 15, verse 17, Jesus says, This I command you, that you love one another. The very next words that John records in verse 18 are these. If the world hates you. Verse 17, this I command you, love one another. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me, before it hated you. So, here it is, the good news and the hard news. In fact, Jesus reveals five difficult statements in a row to the disciples in John 15. Here they are. They've gotten up and left the upper room. They're walking through the city. They've gone out the eastern gate. Now they're walking into the Kidron Valley, down the hill, across the river, up the other side, because they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way, Jesus actually combines a series right here of if-then statements. Hard truths about the disciples' relationship with him and with the world. Both theological commentators, F.F. F. Bruce and R.C. Sproul, include this passage, John 15, 18 to 25, in their books titled, The Hard Sayings of Jesus. So, 
Get ready. You're in for it this morning. The hard sayings of Jesus. In fact, in the New American Standard Bible, this passage is subtitled, Disciples' Relationship to the World. It doesn't sound all that bad, but in the English Standard Version, it is actually titled, The Hatred of the World. In the New International Version, it says, The World Hates the Disciples. And in the American Standard Version, it reads, Opposition from the World. He is about to depart, leaving behind the disciples to do the ministry. His time here on this earth, this world, is just about to end. And Jesus felt compelled. Can you imagine? Compelled to share these words of opposition with his chosen followers. The 12, actually the 11 at this point. In order to prepare them for the days and their ministry ahead. Think about that. Jesus, as he's getting ready, as he's preparing himself to go back to the Father, which is what he tells us in verse 5, but now I am going to him who sent me. That's where our actual passage starts this morning. But as we look at these five brief but hard if-then statements, Jesus' revelation about his followers and all believers ministering for him in the world is a little on the harsh side. Okay, good morning, reality check. Here's what it means to be my disciple. If you love me, right, you love one another. That's how he started this. But he's got five if-then statements, and they're up on the screen for you. First John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, then you know that it has hated me, before it hated you. Verse 20, if they persecuted me, guess what? Then they will also persecute you. Also in verse 20, if they keep my word, then they will keep your words also. Sounds like a positive. But what if they don't? (laughs) They will question everything you say. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, then they would not have sinned. They would not know that they were sinners. They would not feel shame or guilt for their remorseful acts. Verse 24, he repeats it. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. They would not recognize guilt, shame, or feel wrongdoing. But we know he has come. He has spoken. And we are responsible for our actions. These challenges to the disciples' thinking reminded me of the words Matthew writes and records at the end of the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 11, and 12. And these are familiar words, but they just kind of rang out for me this week. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Kind of a, hey, you're a Jewish student. You you know the stories. (laughs) These guys spoke out for the truth, and what happened? Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of of evil against you falsely on account of me. How many of you want that done or said about you? Walking to the Garden of Gethsemane through the Kidron Valley, Jesus tells the disciples, as they are going to continue to minister and serve others for him in the future, the world, as a result, will hate them, persecute them, question them, revile them, and reject them. Oh, and the good news, and some will respond. But for loving and living for him, there will be persecution, rejection, and hatred. 
In fact, if you keep reading uh, in, what is it, verse uh, 6? Well, we'll get there in a second. So why does Jesus do this? Why is he telling them right here in John 15, he's, he's told them about the vines and the branches. They talk about his peace that he's going to leave with them. Why does he choose right here, right now? Look at verse 20 with me. John 15, verse 20. Remember the words that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Remember these words. Jesus gives four clear reminders in the next few verses. First, Jesus reminds them a servant is not greater than his master. He actually quoted this earlier. John writes it down earlier in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 16, when he said, a servant is not greater than his master. Neither is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Here in John 15, 21, Jesus says, this is because they do not know the one who sent me. I think that would have been challenged by the religious leaders, don't you? Well, we know the Father. Whoa, verse 23, boom. In fact, the people who, tra- who put these into verses, this is all there is in John 15, 23. He who hates me hates my Father also. Whoa. Verse 25, Jesus actually quotes Psalm 35, 19. They hated me without a cause. No good reason, no justifiable reason. They hated me because I challenged their way of thinking, their lifestyle, where they were, what they were doing, what they thought they were teaching. He who hates me hates the Father also. The Savior wants to make certain his followers, not just the people, the disciples walking with him that night, but all that would follow after. We're aware that those who reject and deny him, Jesus Christ, are choosing the world's way of thinking, the world's way of living, the world's way of believing. They are not choosing God the Father's way of thinking, living, or believing. This leads to Jesus' words in John 15, verses 26 and 27, if you're following along. Revealing the, tr- the spirit of truth. Here's how the New American Standard Bible puts it in verse 26. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. Verse 27. And you will bear witness of me also, because you have been with me from the beginning. Clearly, we see The Godhead at work here, working together, Father, Son, Spirit, to reveal the truth. And the Son and the Father now are revealing the one to come, the Spirit of truth. Jesus had already spoken in chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 about the Spirit of truth when he said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper another comforter, an intercessor, one who will come alongside of you. That is, he is the spirit of truth, that he may be with you forever. Good news, bad news, good news. This helper that we have, he's with us forever. Again, in chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, only one of two times Jesus actually refers in John, or John refers, but Jesus said, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Now think about that. All that he had said. I always wondered, how did these guys ever remember these stories? They're literally walking through a city, down a slope, into a valley, up a hill, and into a garden. Who, who walks around with a journal in their hands? Hey, 
I'm going to write this down for later. <laughs> Come on, you really believe that's what happened? If you watch The Chosen, Matthew walks around with a journal. He's writing it down. And it's like, okay, maybe, maybe, yeah, well, maybe. But I'm thinking these guys were in an upper room. They've had their feet washed. They've been talking with Jesus. They've just, asked, just eaten the holy Passover meal. They're not carrying around journals with them with, you know, with pen, pen and ink. Jesus reveals that the Spirit, the one who will come alongside of us, will bear witness of him. Yes, the Holy Spirit bears witness. He gives testimony. He brings to remembrance all that Jesus has said and done. He will be with us. He will abide and dwell in us. And he will do so in all those who believe in Jesus' name. And we're told how long, all together now, forever. That's a long time. Think of that. Jesus is promising that the Spirit of God, for those who believe in his name, will be with them forever. Next week, we will see that Jesus expands even more on the person and work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 16. But for today, we see that the Spirit will bear witness and bring things to remembrance. And Jesus' disciples will also bear witness, give testimony to, recall, respond, teach who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. If they hadn't, you and I would have no clue what happened that day on the way to the garden. As Jesus continues walking with his disciples through the valley up the other side of the hill, he emphasizes or reveals the purpose of what or why he's sharing these hard and difficult things with them. John records Jesus' words in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. We see the Lord's first declaration in verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. With rough days ahead, Jesus is just pre preparing the disciples for trouble. They will be hated, persecuted, rejected. Whoa, when, when, that, when I even think about that, I just go... I, Wow, I'm not prepared for this stuff. In verse 2, Jesus adds these words, that the, they will be outcasts from the synagogue, and an hour is coming for everyone who thinks this, who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Everyone who seeks to kill you is offering service to God. And I think John the Apostle is remembering Saul of Tarsus before he was Paul the Apostle. What do you think? They will actually think they're doing service to God. Wow. There are people here in this world today that think the exact same thing. The words Jesus speaks here, so that you may be kept from stumbling reminded me of the very words Jude uses to close out his epistle. It's not very long, just 25 verses. But we believe that Jude was one of the half-brothers of Jesus. The name Jude, or Judas, is mentioned as a son of the carpenter and Mary. In fact, one of his mother's sons in Matthew 13, 55. Here is how Jude closes his letter in verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority. When? Before all time. Now, and I love this word, and forevermore. Amen. As his disciples, or as disciples of Christ, we are kept from stumbling by Jesus himself. 
the only God, our Savior, the eternal blameless one, Jude writes in verse 24, who is Christ our Lord. Let me just say that again. As disciples of the anointed one, we are kept from stumbling by Jesus himself, the only God, our Savior, the eternal blameless one, who is Christ our Lord. And here on his way to the garden, preparing for his execution, Jesus wants to prepare us, to prepare his disciples for the the difficult times ahead, the trials and tribulations, as Jude's brother James put it. We will experience serving and living for him through trial and tribulation. Don't you love James 1, 3? Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter what? Good times. Good stuff. I, I wish that's what it said. When you encounter various trials and testings, because this is what produces patience and endurance. Remember I told you, we see Jesus' second purpose of, or declaration in verse 4, John 16, 4. But these things I have spoken to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And, <laughs> Jesus added these words, these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I have been with you. While he was present, there was only a little need for Jesus to emphasize the trials and tribulations to come. He was with them. He was the focus point, the target of people's ire, of their hatred. Even the Jewish leaders and the world's harsh treatment was focused on him. But now, now, he was going back to the Father. That's what verse 5 says, I'm going to him who sent me. And as he does that, the time for difficult truths and the promise of the helper, the Holy Spirit, have come. They were there. It was time. You know what Jesus has said many times, my time has not yet come, but here it was. It's time. You need to hear these things. You need to understand these things because you are going, you and I are going to live these things if we live and stand up for Jesus. John 16 Jesus will continue his discussion with the disciples about his departure and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. We'll hear more about that next week. But for now, I want to offer three principles that the Spirit shared with me. There were just things that he laid on my heart for me this week. But I, I felt I originally hadn't even put these in here. <laughs> and then I thought, no, no. This is what what the Spirit said. Jesus wants to keep me safe. He wants to keep me from stumbling. Jesus wants me to remember these truths, the ones that he has revealed to us, so that I can seek to be faithful and effective following and living for him. However, Number three, the third thing I heard, there is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. We've heard about those in the if-thens this morning. However, the Almighty has made himself available to us. The Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, lives in me. He comforts me. He encourages me. He actually intercedes with the Father and the Son for me. Wow, is that beyond what you can imagine or think? If you're not getting tingles, you're missing the point. That's why I shared them with you, because I didn't want you to miss the point. Jesus wants to keep us safe, keep us from stumbling. He wants us to remember these truths. He wants us to know there's a cost, but he will be with us forever. The Lord reminded me of these truths right here, reading John 15 and 16. 
However, I also have three takeaways that you will notice at the bottom of the handout if you even opened it up this morning. The first one comes in John 15, verse 17. You can see it. This I command you, Jesus said, love one another. We know Jesus responded to a lawyer in Matthew 22, sharing the greatest and foremost commandment, love God, love the Lord your God. He pointed out to that lawyer and the crowd that was listening that day, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So love God and love one another. That's the idea of what Jesus did for the believers. But they're going to be in the world now without him. The second takeaway was revealed in verse 21. Treat others as you would have them treat you. The NIV says they will treat you. This is verse 21, John 16, 21, the NIV. Let me see, uh, says, no, excuse me, 15, 21. They will treat you this way because of my name. In fact, people thinking about this phrase, treat others as you would have them treat you, has often been labeled, as you can see, the golden rule. The third takeaway revealed to me, to me this week was in verse 27, John 15, 27, and you will bear witness of me also. Again, aren't these familiar words? Acts 1, 8, we know that Jesus spoke these compelling words to his disciples as his physical departure from the planet. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. We'd be pretty remote from where they were here in the U.S. Look what we have here revealed to us altogether, even in the midst of these hard sayings in John 15. Love the Lord your God and love one another the great commandments. Treat others as you would have them treat you, the golden rule. You will be my witnesses, the great commission. Whoa, I do not believe that this is a coincidence that Jesus wove all these ideas into these words at this time, right before his departure. Jesus is reminding his disciples, his chosen ones, he's reminding us we are to love God and love others. We are to treat others as we want them to treat us. And we are Christ's witnesses to all those around us. Let's bow for a closing word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you are our Savior, Redeemer, and as we sang this morning, our friend. This week, Help us to be your hands and feet, your salt and light, your representatives and your ambassadors to all those around us, to our family and friends, to our loved ones, to our neighbors, co-workers, classmates, acquaintances. Lord, help us be your salt, light, hands and feet, even to those who might not love us or even respect us. We are your children. Thank you for loving us and blessing us. We are grateful for this time together today. Go with us now as we enter our mission field, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.